And now join us on the Word of God through Jesus Christ, Street and Outreach Ministry, as the Lord uses us to watch a clip of feeding the sheep. Father, in Jesus' name, forgive us for our sins and our shortcomings. Forgive us for our faults and for our wrongs, every last one of them. Forgive us, Lord, for everything we have done from the time we were born up to now. Everything that we did against your will, your word, and your way. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for bringing us into your family. We just thank you. Now, Father, talk to us. Allow me to decrease that you may increase. Fill us with the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. Give us a spiritual understanding of your most precious and holy word. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the matchless name of Jesus. There's no one equal to you, O oh Father. There's no one who can bring us through and from what you brought us through and from. No one. No one can do it. Right now, we're at the point of getting ready to be blessed. Please just talk to us. In Jesus' name, I thank you and I pray. Amen. The thought that God gave me for this talk is the start of a series. And this is part one. And the thought is called not in my house not in my house that's what God said the thought come from him as well as the title not in my house part one the title is Elohim officiates a wedding. The book of Genesis, that word, Genesis, means origin. It means alpha, which means beginning. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet. It means birth, it means start, it means opening, it means provenance, which means home. We are living in days and doing things that we choose to do, not even realizing that this is not the way God intended it to be. None of this is the way that God intended it to be. None of this. There's a lot of things going on in this world. And it is not the way that God intended it to be. People are pushing all kind of agendas. People are doing all kinds of things. 
and is not the way that God intended it to be. Some people have an excuse. They just don't know. Some people don't have an excuse because they profess to know. If you see people who say, I read my Bible every day, then that means that, well, they shouldn't have no excuse as to what they're doing. That's contrary to the will, the way, and the word of God. No excuse. And for those that don't read scripture, for those that don't know, it is up to us that are Christians to show them and to witness about the Lord to them to let them know you're on the wrong side and you're doing it the wrong way. And as often said, people have deterred from the message and instead of staying with being born again and holiness and the mission being going to heaven, a lot of people are so busy, complacent, and comfortable here in the earth realm doing what they want to do and leaving this world and getting caught unawares and getting caught in the wrong. Each day that the Holy Ghost wakes us up in the morning is another chance to say, Lord, help me today. We have no excuse. Each night before we lay down to go to sleep, we have the opportunity to look back over our day and to thank God for what he's done for us and how far he's brought us and the things that he's brought us through and the things that he's worked out for us during the day. And as we're getting ready to go to sleep, we have an opportunity to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for how you've done it. Thank you because we didn't deserve it. We didn't deserve one bit of it. We didn't deserve nothing he did for us. We did not deserve it. So in order to understand what God's will is, in order to understand the purpose of us being here and any other question that we have about life, about this earth realm, the answer is right here in the book of Genesis. So the Lord is leading us to go back to the beginning. Whenever you read, and the Lord lead me to sh share this with those in the theology class of this ministry, a lot of them have already learned this. And if you're in the theology class and you forgot this, then you have your notes that tell you this. Whenever you read the title, God, in Scripture, 
in the English text, it says God. But depending on which group of books you're in, whether the old will or covenant or testament, or whether the new will, covenant or testament, depending on where you are, God actually means something else in a particular language that scripture was translated from before God translated into English. Very important to understand that. In Genesis 1 and 1, scripture says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the heavens there are three heavens. Three. There's three heavens. The third heaven is where God lives. The first heaven is when you go outside and you look up and you see the birds and the clouds. That's the first heaven. When you go out and you look maybe in a telescope or you study space, you see the second heaven. Then the third heaven is where God lives. The only way to get there is when you leave this world. It's the only way to get there. Genesis 1 and 1 says God. Now let's deal with that. Because in order to understand why we are created, then we have to understand the creator. It's important to understand him. Who he is. His nature. His character. His traits. Who is he? God. The word there for God is actually in the Hebrew Elohim. And this name Elohim is used 2,606 times in the Old Testament. And it is a plural of the word Eloah, which also means God. Elohim means gods in the ordinary sense, but specifically used in the plural, thus, especially with the article or the object of the supreme God. Elohim, which is sometimes El or the Aramaic Elah, is the English form of God. And it's the first of the three essential or main names of deity. Elohim is a uniplural noun formed from El meaning strength or the strong one, and Allah, which, not Allah, Allah, which means to swear and it means oath. It also is used as to bind oneself by an oath, so implying faithfulness. A uniplural noun, because that's what Elohim is, it's a uniplural noun, for those that don't know, a uniplural noun is a word that appears in the plural form, but is used for singular and plural subjects alike. Fish and deer are examples of uniplural nouns in English. Uni means one. 
or one piece. Una, uni. When used to refer to God, Elohim is a uniplural word, meaning God is one and yet more than one. In scripture, he is presented as a triune God. And if we miss that, then we miss the truth about the character and the nature of God. He is a triune God. The Jews understood this because in Deuteronomy 6 and 4, which is called the Shema, Scripture says the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, God there is Elohim, but Lord is from the Hebrew word Yehovah, which means the self-existent or eternal. The Tetragrammaton, which is Y-H-W-H, appears without its own vowels and its exact pronunciation is debated. Some say Jehovah, some say Yehovah, some say Yahweh, some say Yahweh. The Hebrew text does insert the vowels for Adonai. I know some people say Adonai, but no, it's in the Hebrew, it's Adonai. And that means Lord or Lord over all. It's important to understand that because when you understand that God is a triune God, then when you run into Genesis 1 and 26, where it says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness when you run into that then you'll understand wait a minute who was god talking to when he said us who was he talking about when he said us let us make man in our image now image here is from the Hebrew word, Selim, which is used 17 times in the, Old, in the Old Testament, and it means to shade. It means a phantom. In other words, figuratively, it's an illusion, a resemblance, hence a representative figure. It signifies a replica. Let us make man in our image. Let's make him a replica of us. Now, there's many other religions and beliefs who would say that this image is physical, which is not. Because God is a spirit, John 4, verse 24. So, so, so this, this physical, physical image, image that people are talking about, Muslims and other beliefs, they're in error because if God is saying, let us make man in our image, and he's speaking about physical, then there would not be two genders. But there are two genders, and yet, both of them are made in the image of God, which cannot be physical. It can't be physical at all. Instead, the image is spiritual. It's important to understand that spiritual likeness is from the hebrew word demuth and that's used 25 times in the old testament and it means resemblance there we go with that word again it means model 
It means shape. It means like. It means form. And it means pattern. It's from the Hebrew word domal, which means to compare by implication a resemblance. God said, let us make man in our image after our life. Verse 27 says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, but male and female created he them. Now, if there is a conversation about an equality between male and female, that equality is spiritual, not physical. Why? Because physically, we do different things. A woman's body can carry a life. And after reproducing the seed and carrying this life, she can give birth to this life. And a man's body can't. Can't. A man, his body is built and gives him a certain kind of brawniness and strength to protect physically in ways that the woman can't. Not only that, even when it comes to intimacy, the man is the projector. His seed is projected. And the woman is receptive. She receives the seed and reproduces it. So the image cannot be physical. Now I'm going to jump way down there, down the spiritual road, and I'm going to say this. That's why certain offices in the fivefold ministry are gender uh, some are I said this way that's why thank you Lord some of the offices in the fivefold ministry are for certain genders and certain offices aren't and won't be why because at the same time of God issuing out this anointing he also is in compliance with the order that he's made things now man on the other hand just gives the impression that everything that was made just runs amok and that's not true there's a lot of people that are taught and that say god can use anybody to do anything well when will he make a man have a baby the answer is he won't let's let's chew on that for a minute he won't he will not go against his order he is a god of order. When he made everything, Genesis chapter 1, verse 4 says, And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. But in verse 4, again, he said, it's written that it was good. In verse 10, and God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was 
good. In verse 12, and the earth brought forth grass and herb, yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. In verse 18, Scripture says, And to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. Verse 21, And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. In verse 25, And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And then in verse 31, And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. So everything God made during that first week of creation, six days, after he made it, he looked at it, and he saw that it was good. Everything was complete. Everything was finished. Good right there is from the Hebrew word tob and is used 559 times in the Old Testament. And as, a, as an adjective, good in the widest sense means good. Well, tob uh, as an adjective means good, favorable, festive, pleasing, pleasant, well, better, right, best. Look at all of those words. And they're all synonyms of the spiritual word good. I like where it says festive because we ought to celebrate God. <laughs> and we do when we understand that all that he does is good. We also see that what he does is pleasant. We also see that it's well. We also see that God's way is better than our way. And in verse 31 of Genesis 1, where it says, it was very good. Very is from the Hebrew word meod, and it means, as an adverb, exceedingly, very Greatly and highly. Highly good. When he looked at everything, he was pleased. A lot of people say, well, God slept on the seventh day. No, he didn't. He finished it. God don't sleep. He finished everything on the sixth day. And he looked over his own work. He checked his own work. And saw that it was me old told very good meod that means very in the hebrew and told in the hebrew means good so here was the order of everything he put everything together now chapter 2 tells you the first three verses about the origin of the Sabbath because there's even a belief built on the Sabbath as their uh, foundation and according to them if you keep this Sabbath you'll go to heaven and if you don't you won't they persecute the believers who worship God on the Sunday which is the first day of the week and scripture says that that is the day of the Lord, Sunday, the 
the first day of the week. It's not odd that God would have anything first, the first day of the week. But the Sabbath was made for man. Scripture says, chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. That means everything was in place. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. That means he ceased working. He stopped. He was finished. He completed everything. There was nothing else to do. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, meaning he set it apart. Because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Or in the Hebrew, it says created to make. He sanctified that day as a memorial saying he finished on the sixth day and on the seventh, everything was complete, which is why the number seven is a number of completion. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining us on the Word of God through Jesus Christ Street and Outreach Ministry as we watch the clip on feeding the sheep. I pray that you got something out of it and got encouraged. You can reach the ministry at 475-300-3850-247. God bless you. And again, thank you for watching. In Jesus' name, amen.